Wonderful. So today I'm very honored to have uh, Professor Gary Chalice here uh, to have a talk about his personal legend and also about some methodologies of economics. Um, so, uh, so Professor Gary Chalice was really um, the person that enlightens me when I almost want to give up in academia. So, uh, and I guess all of you can see the light in him today from his very um, like warm-hearted personalities and uh, his intelligence. So let's welcome Professor Gary Chalice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can applaud, I won't stop you. So I'm, I'm delighted to be invited. This is a, an interesting occurrence. This is something that you always wonder how you can do this, but um, as far as Lu Yao goes, yeah, you know, I, I always had to fight. I always had to fight. I have talents, but I always had to fight. And, and she was in a bad way. Some bad things had happened and things were tough. And I just kind of told her that you have to be a warrior. You just have to be a warrior. And you just have to push your way through it. You have to be a warrior. Um, and that's, that's what I do. That's what I do. Um, I don't know how well this works with people in China, but you know, if you want something in this life, I think you need to ask for it. It helps get it. If you ask for something and someone says no, maybe you ask again. Um, I was rejected at uh, Berkeley for the PhD program. Um, and I said, what is this? And I was, at the time I was 41. So it turns out that in the United States, there's a statute about what they call age discrimination, that they're not allowed to discriminate against people who are, can you guys understand me okay? Yes, no? I can speak more slowly. Would that, would that be helpful? Uh, a, a little bit hard to understand. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Here's my problem. I am at home. And when I'm home, I tend to speak normally. But there's another <laughs> of English that I can speak. And this is what I speak when I go to Europe. It's called international English. <laughs> every single syllable. And I speak slowly. Can you understand better now? Yeah. 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 It's, I, it's, it's not my native language that I'm speaking now. I'm shifting to an international English. Remind me, look confused, raise your hand if I forget. Okay. So what I did was I bludgeoned my way into Berkeley. They rejected me. I said, what do you mean? No. And I went in there and I was upset and I was angry. And I made it clear that I wasn't going to stand for this. And it turns out there's a statute that if you're over 40, there's an age discrimination issue. And that's what this was. And then they knew that I knew it. And then they knew that I was going to make trouble. And they also knew that it was important to me or I wouldn't have bothered going in like that. So I, um, I persuaded them to give me a chance. And so they admitted me after they had, had rejected me. Here's an interesting story, actually. So, I teach negotiation and I get students from all over and I have some Chinese students. I had one Chinese student, uh, he's a smart guy. Um, his English wasn't so great, this happens a lot. But he was a smart guy and I give this advice and I say to people, if someone says no to you, you say to them, what do you mean no? So he applied for a program at the University of Southern California and they rejected him and he called them up. And he basically said, what do you mean? No. He said, what can I do to improve? Blah, blah, blah. And they told him some things to change and he applied again and they accepted him. He basically, they rejected him and he said, what are you talking about? And he, they let him in. Sometimes, sometimes you have to push your way through things sometimes, but 
I'll give you an example of something else that this happened in Beijing at the airport. Um, I was at the airport there with my hosts and uh, they found out that I needed to get a stamp on my passport because I was flying. I don't remember exactly which flight that one was, but I was flying. I needed to get a stamp on my passport and there was a really, really long line. It's Beijing airport. Um, and there's a window way far down there. And you can see there's somebody at the window and there's a line. But my host had heard me say this the day before in the seminar about asking for things. And she saw that there was another window all the way at the end, at the other end of the, the front of the line. And there was a guy sitting there at the window. Now the window was closed, but there was somebody sitting there. So she walked down to the window, all the way down to the window. She knocked on the window. The guy opened it. She showed him the passport and he stamped it. And we left. And if she doesn't go up to that window, we have to wait in this whole long line. So just a little bit of a life lesson I'm not sure these things apply so much in your own life, but some of these things happened in China. So maybe they apply. Um, I like it when people have questions. I don't know if that's going to work very well. Um, should I keep that? Maybe I'll keep the chat open. So if someone has a question and they don't want to shout out, I opened up the chat so you can ask questions too. Um, I'm going to present slides, but I, I basically, it's not obvious to me exactly what is desired for me. There's a lot of things I can talk about. I can talk about my whole path, how I got here. I can talk about ideas and research and how to do research. But if I'm not mistaken, this is an undergraduate class, right? Uh, yes. So yeah. some of them are freshmen and yeah. some of them are from like data science uh, major but senior students uh, they are interested in econ so most likely people have a very technical background I, I would i would expect and that's pretty common in economics i'm on the less technical side of things though i'm very much more a behavioral sort of person uh, some might argue, some have argued, I'm not really an economist, I'm more of a psychologist. I'm really a social scientist. So what happened with me is I always had some intuition for people, always, but it got developed as I got older. And then I started playing poker, which helped. And then I started traveling on my own, mostly overseas. And I learned to talk to people. I learned how I learned to understand people. So I got into a lot of different adventures and experiences in life. And uh, from those experiences, I learned a lot about how people actually behave. So what I really bring to the table in this area is my intuition and my ability to design experimental environments that are interesting and useful. So that's what I like to do. It's probably not as technical as what you've been exposed to. Uh, I'm not sure what I can say about that. Um, you're in a different educational environment than in the US. The US doesn't do technical so much. Uh, Americans don't like to do math, it seems. And most of the people, for example, who come to the US to study are much better technically than the American students. So that's typically your advantage if you were coming to the US. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say anything, but I'm on the other side. So I'm interested in how, how things work and why things, why things work. Oh, I see you got onto the big screen now. Okay, that's good. Actually, we have six screens of this. Six screens. Yeah. Wow. I will send you the photo afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressive. So I don't know, is it appropriate to ask for questions? I can just talk. Um, I don't know. Don't be, so, don't be shy. Don't be shy. You can type your questions, guys. Um, that's, maybe it's hard. I mean, I can just keep talking. So 
No, I, I got out of college. I went to college because why? Because it was Vietnam. And if I didn't go to college, I might get drafted. And then I'd have to go to Vietnam. And I didn't want to do that. So I went to college, but I wasn't really interested in being there. And this was again, Vietnam and the times were, this was the late sixties. And it was a time, a time of turmoil in the United States. So I stayed in college, but I didn't really participate that much in college. I, I played cards. I did a variety of other things, um, but I wasn't much of a student. But I made it through. I got my degree. And then I didn't want to be part of society. So I graduated in 1971, and I took off. Well, first I worked at a I, I traveled around a little bit and then i had a little temporary job delivering beer or pick, delivering beer to, to bars and then i uh went overseas and i went to europe and to the middle east for a long time for about nine months and i came back and i moved to california to san francisco at the end of 1972 and i lived in the bay area for 20 years 30 years, but for 20 years in the 80s and 70s and the 80s as a single guy in the 70s and 80s in San Francisco in the Bay Area. It was, it was wild times, things that I am not at liberty to really discuss, but it was wild times. So I've got a lot of experiences from that. And again, I think it, it really helped with my intuition about people and how people behave, which is more than anything else, probably what I bring to the table. I also am a very good writer, which turns out to be very useful, and I'm a native speaker, so it makes life easy for me. But that's not a skill that, it's hard to write in another language. Anyway, so uh, that's what I did. I did that, I was in various businesses. Um, I made some money, and then I had some real estate and real estate loans, and I was kind of comfortable. And I decided, one day I saw an article in uh, the local newspaper, the San Francisco newspaper, about a guy at Stanford who had won a Nobel Prize in economics. And um, I didn't know the guy, but they interviewed some of his colleagues for the article. And I knew one of them. Uh, he was a professor at Stanford. He had been a year ahead of me at the University of Michigan in the honors math program. So I said, wow, he's a professor at Stanford. I know the guy. He's a really smart guy. And I said, he's as smarter than I am. But I said, not an order of magnitude. I was probably wrong because the guy that I was was Paul Milgram. So smart guy, smarter than me, certainly. Order of magnitude, maybe two, I don't know. Um, but that's when I realized what it, how smart you had to be to be an academic at a top school. And I said, huh, you know, maybe I can go and get a PhD and I can put it on my wall and admire it, if nothing else, it would be a challenge for myself. Because I was a little bit bored. I had made money and I was bored. And so I applied and they rejected me. I said, no, 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 no. And then they, they accepted me. And then I went. I started, I was 41 years old. You guys are not 41 years old. Um, I was in the program at Berkeley for five years. Um, interesting time. I didn't find it super difficult. A lot of people complain about graduate school being miserable. I kind of did it part time, but I'm, I'm pretty efficient with my time. So maybe I'm good with that. I don't know, but I, I didn't find it that bad. And then I tried to get a job and that was a nightmare. It took four tries from the market to get a job because I do experiments and I'm old. And the market doesn't really like those two things. So the only way I ever overcame that was by publishing a bunch of papers. And it turns out I'm good at that. <clears throat> and so that's basically how I got here. But what I look at is how people behave. And one of the questions that I have is, how can you get better social behavior in difficult economic environments where the, the tendency might be to be selfish or to behave in a way that might be individually rational but not socially optimal? How can you get people to cooperate more? 
Um, so I've done a lot of work. In the old days, it was social preferences. I haven't done so much on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about social preferences when we get to the slides. Um, and then later on in my career, I've done other things. And one of the things that I'm still doing, uh, I've done a number of papers on this, is communication. And communication is a way that you can get better outcomes, better social outcomes, and individual outcomes, too. So a lot of my work has gone to how to get better social outcomes. I also have a line of work that I won't really be talking about, I won't have slides about, which is individual decision making. How can you make better individual decisions, um, which is very interesting as well. I'm looking at behavior without um, strategic interaction. Um, but I, I have my best intuitions about interaction environments and what people are going to do in those. So that's what I like to study. Um, I have tested theory. Testing theory isn't always the best way to make a big impact. So there's one, maybe only one of my papers that's really made a serious, at least arguably has made a serious impact actually in the world. And that's my exercise paper with Uri Gnizzi. What we did, we took this idea that I had. So I'll explain it to you. And I'll tell you what Uri did. This is a nice little story. Um, my son was having problems with spelling. I don't know if you know what spelling is, but English spelling is really, really messy. There are, there are no really good rules. It's a lot of just wild stuff. And he had trouble with it. And he was doing poorly. My wife had this idea that we should pay him $5 if he would get 100% on his spelling test. And me being weak, I said, we should also give him a dollar if he gets one wrong. But I'm weak. So we started doing this. And after a while, he started improving and getting 100%. That was impressive. And then after a while, we stopped paying him. And then after a while after that, he still did it for a while. But after a while after that, he finally stopped. But he developed a taste. He, he learned that he enjoyed getting a high score in the spelling test. So I had had this idea about intrinsic motivation. Um, intrinsic, there's this idea that you could crowd out intrinsic motivation. And there's a story behind that. Um, they had these kids, these kids liked to do something. It was like playing a game. And then they started paying the kids to play the game. And then after a while, they stopped paying the kids. And then the kids didn't want to play the game anymore. They had had an intrinsic motivation to enjoy the game, but then money substituted for that and the intrinsic motivation got crowded out. That's the story. Okay, so I had the opposite. I said, I think you can crowd in intrinsic motivation. You can teach people that they actually enjoy something. We turned into a habit formation story but I talked to Uri about this at a conference in Arizona while sitting in the, in the hot tub. And Uri ran with this story and created this whole experimental idea where you, we paid people to go to the gym and uh, we gave them a, we had different treatments. One, we introduced them to the, just the idea that exercise is good for you. Another treatment, you have to go to the gym once in a week and you got paid some amount of money. And the main treatment, you had to go twice a week for a month and you get paid $100. Um, and we did this and we could track attendance before and attendance afterward. We really don't know if they exercise, but we did it a second time and we, we got uh, biometric data the second time, which actually was useful, turns out, and it helped. It showed an effect. Um, so Uri ran with this and created this experiment and did it at Chicago and did it at San Diego. Um, and this turned out to be a big paper because it turned into, not only was it published in, in Econometrica, 
but it's used by a lot of companies now. Um, people have seen that you can incentivize some of these activities. Now, it, it hasn't worked with getting people to stop bad habits. It seems to be better at starting new good habits than stopping bad habits. That seems to be more difficult. Like stopping smoking has been very difficult uh, to pay people. They stop when they're being paid not to smoke, and as soon as that's gone, they go back to smoking. It's very hard to stop it. But we have a lot of people that have taken up the idea of, for health purposes, paying people, reducing their uh, health insurance if they do if they do exercise programs. So it's it's an idea that we were very helpful in getting out there. I mean, I don't know if I really want to say we're the first, but in some ways we were the first. Um, so I'm proud of that one. Most of the time in research, I don't get the sense that you're changing the world, but you are looking at interesting things. And um, it's an enjoyable experience. Now, you probably are not interested in that. What do most of you guys expect you're going to do? Oh, I have questions. Ah, good. I should look at them. Methodology and behavioral experiments. So, yes, I can talk about experiments. I don't know how much people are interested in experiments. Um, I can talk about it along the way when um, I present the slides, which I could move into. What have I realized about social? Well, so I will do that. Um, if you're really interested in experimental, I have specialized slides, but I suspect most people are not so interested. But if I'm wrong, I can go through them. Okay. So, and the second question was talk a little bit about what you have realized about social relationships during your traveling time as you referred. That's all right. It's not about income. That's fine. So you learn to observe people when you travel to somewhere and you don't speak the language and they don't speak your language. You have to learn to look at each other. You have to learn to communicate without words. And you learn to pick up small signals because that's what people do. They make hand signals and eye gestures and you learn to communicate and you learn to be sensitive to smaller things when you don't speak the language. So here's a crazy story that actually happened in Beijing, the same trip. We were going to the airport and I'm really good at picking up these things. I've traveled a lot and often don't speak the language. I'm very good at languages. And I, I'm a little bit psychic, so I pick things up too. But they were, we were arriving at the airport, and, and my host was talking to her two graduate students, and she was clearly giving directions. They were discussing plans and contingencies. And of course, they were talking in Mandarin. But I understood what they were saying just from watching them, from what they were doing. And I answered the question in English. And they looked at me. Like, how is that possible? Because I don't speak. I know Ni Hao, and I know Xie Xie, and that's about it. So maybe I'm just too psychic. But no, I read what they were doing. And you can learn that. So you can learn more about people and observing people from traveling. That's one thing. And also, when you're traveling, you learn to approach people on a different level than everyday living. And the learning rate is accelerated because you're not involved in as much mundane, every day is the same day activity. So you have more experiences per week than you have when you're working at a job. Um, so I think travel is a great thing. Um, I learned about people. I learned a bit about myself. I learned to talk to people. I didn't like to talk to people, but when you travel by yourself, you have to. Um, and I learned that I have something in common with everybody. I can find, I can make a conversation with anyone. That's, that's something very useful in social relationships. You know, there are a lot of people that we get on the wrong topic these days and it would get very ugly. But there are topics for anybody that I'm going to be able to talk to them about. I'm going to be able to have a conversation. And I can do that with anybody at all. I can even do that without a language, just by signs and 
I did this on an elevator again in China. There was a there was a pretty Chinese girl and there was me who's maybe not as pretty, but hey, you know, I'm different. And she liked me and I liked her and there were little signs and it was goodbye, but it was very sweet, but there was no words. Well, that's not true. She said something in Chinese and I said something in English. But there, you know, so you can communicate even without a language. So I think that's a lesson that I learned is that you can you can you can interact with people and you can make it a positive. But it's important to keep the right attitude. And I, I have problems with my attitude. I, I have serious problems with my attitude. But if you can keep a good attitude, you can do a lot. And um, so perhaps I'll move on to the slides unless people, what do you guys want to do? Luya, what do you want me to do here? Yeah, before you go to the slides, I really want to ask a, a, a question. It's like, uh, what, what was in your mind when Berkeley rejected you? Uh, because I can interview some of our students. How can they do that? How can they do that? They can't do that. <laughs> How can they do that? They can't do that. That's age discrimination. That's what immediately... No, that's not true. The very first instant was a little bit of shock and, dis and, and disappointment. But very, very quickly, the reaction was, they can't do that. And what do you mean, no? No, no, they can't do that. I, I think that's just quite different because we can interview one of our students. Like, do you ever, uh, like, what was in your mind when university reject your uh, applications or hypersatically? Uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, at least a little bit disappoint, disappointed, and then I just uh, let it go. Everybody's well, you will argue with the admission committee. Uh, you, you know, will, if you think that you're right, wouldn't you say something? Uh, no. You know, I, I just, I think I... That's the question. If you think that they're wrong, do you speak up? I talk too much, but maybe it's good. Lu Yao, if you didn't push... Would you have got your PhD at the end? Uh, no. <laughs> no. 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 You have to push. Yeah. Sometimes. Not always. Not always. But, you know, lots of times you have to push. That's what, uh, actually, that's really what I got uh, enlightened. Because before I met you, I would think, okay, I'm not good enough if they reject me. I would <laughs> not think it's like, how, it's their fault. It's like, there is yeah. discrimination. Yeah, my immediate reaction is they don't know who they're talking to. They don't know what they're doing. That's my immediate I, I reaction. like your attitude. That's great. Well, it might be arrogance. It might be confidence. But you know what? I was right. Right? Here I am, right? I was yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, and you, you also have a second proof because I'm here. Because huh? I, I believe in what you said. I also think, okay, they are wrong. I should get a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> they don't I mean, know what they are talking to. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, plus there's the legal issues too. But yeah, you have to push. You have to, I mean, that's, I don't know. I, look, I know that China, at least academics in China, is, is super, super, super competitive. I know that. Um, so you have a lot of the competition there as well. And there it seems to be that what you have to do is study, 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 study all the time. And don't look to this side or that side, but study all the time. And I respect it. It's a, it's a very competitive process. The U.S. isn't quite that way. But the U.S. culture is more competitive. So I wonder about Chinese culture. Isn't it competitive too? It would seem like it is, but then there's this idea that, oh, the authorities said no, and they must be correct, so I must not be good enough. And that's not, that's not the way I was raised. And maybe that's American. That might not be American. That might be Jewish. Might be Jewish. 
You know, Jews got told no a lot. So you have to argue with it. I don't know, but it's a different attitude. And I find that it's useful. And you don't have to be nasty. You really don't have to be nasty. You can be really nice. And you ask for something and people are happy. So that's, you know, on little things, be nice when you can. Here, here's a little story. So you can talk about positive reciprocity and negative reciprocity. Negative reciprocity means that you think that somebody didn't do what they should have or they actually did something mean to you. And you want to, in some sense, punish them or not help them at least. And positive reciprocity is that someone did something nice for you and you would like to do more for them because they were nice than you would have ordinarily done. And in experiments, you almost never see positive reciprocity. It's very rare. Occasionally, I can give you the instances, sometimes, rarely. Negative reciprocity is very common. But I have one very clean example of positive reciprocity from real life. It was, um, I was a student at Berkeley, so it was the early mid nine. it was the early 1990s. And I was going, there's, the Bay Area has bridges across parts of the Bay. I don't know how many of you know the Bay Area, but there's bridges and they're 10 kilometers long or something. And um, there's an entrance then, this, this is before people had automated automatic things. And there was an entrance and there were lines. And I'm usually in a hurry, but that day I was not in a hurry. And I'm usually in the left lane because I'm an aggressive driver. But this day I was in the right lane and there was a car. A woman had gotten out of the line and she was trying to get back into the line so she could get to the toll plaza. And people weren't letting her in. She tried to get in, the guy zoomed up. And she was getting really frustrated. And you could see it. She was getting really upset. And then it's my turn. And I look at her and I wave her into the spot. I say, please go ahead, lady. And she waved back at me. She got in the spot. It's nothing. It's really nothing, right? It's a small thing because she was upset. Why not do it? And I get to the toll plaza and I get my payment, which at that dollar, it was a dollar then. And I'm giving the dollar, offering the guy a dollar. And he says, the car before you paid for you. So unless she does that all the time to random strangers, that was positive reciprocity. It does exist. So... Sometimes, I'll, I'll tell you other stories. Sometimes you be nice to someone and maybe it comes back to you. Um, my son, well, we had a family, friends when we lived in the Bay Area for a long time and friends of friends who we knew we were somewhat close to, one of their kids was dying. He was 13 years old. He was dying of cancer in the hospital. And we went to pay our last respects. We just did it. You know, you don't do it because it's going to be beneficial to you. We just did it. It was the thing to do. We wanted to do it. And many years later, my older son was looking for a job. And he did a poor, I got him set up through the same family, through the son of that, in that family, for an interview. And he did a poor job. And they said that he would, they would not normally be giving him a chance but because of family connections or family history, I think they said, uh, they would give him a chance for a temporary intern position. And if he did well, they would talk about a permanent position. So what did that family history mean? I had forgotten. I had completely forgotten about it. And it, the thing is that the guy who would be his boss was the brother of the, of the guy who was the father of the son who died. So he knew about it. And basically, because we had done this nice thing, my son got a job. And he had been looking for a long time. And I didn't do that to try to get my son a job, obviously. So sometimes if you do something nice, 
and it doesn't really cost you very much, sometimes you get a lot back from it. That's, that's maybe a useful lesson. What do you need or experience to have to get an econ PhD? What do you suggest trying right after a bachelor's degree? An excellent, excellent questions. Um, my belief is that a PhD is for someone who really likes to do research. I don't know if you can possibly know right now if you really like to do research. I, I don't think you can know that yet. I had no idea until my 40s. I had no idea, none whatsoever. Um, you, you can go to a, another graduate program. You can get a master's degree. I understand that a master's degree is still worth something in China, um, especially, well, but a PhD, you have to be good at staying with, you don't really need to, you need to be able to finish a large project, large projects. You need to be able to take on a large project and push your way through it and get the thing done. It's more about perseverance than it is about raw intelligence. It's the ability to produce something and to work. I've known people who were good researchers who weren't really super bright. Um, I could give you names of big guys who are not super bright and they're really big guys, but they're good at research. And then there are people who are really, really smart that can't do research. But to get a PhD, to get into a PhD program, well, you need to have a balance. Uh, a US, I don't know about PhD programs somewhere else. I only know about sort of mid-high level PhD programs in the US. Uh, and what you look for when you're doing admissions is you look for a combination of the letters from people and who wrote the recommendation letters. You look at the grades, but the grades don't really mean that much to you. You look at the scores on the tests, but to be really honest with you, and maybe I shouldn't be really honest with you, a lot of admissions officers are suspicious of scores uh, sent from China. So you will find that people are a little bit concerned about such scores. So then you'll lean more heavily on other things than scores. But traditionally, you look at that. And one of the things that people look at as well is your statement of purpose, which is why you want to do this, what you hope to do with it, where you're going with it. I had no idea. My application actually was very weak because I had no, no real statement of purpose. I didn't know what I was doing. And that's probably why I got rejected, actually. Um, they had that, you know, but I had, I had, you know, what I did was I said, how can you reject me? I said, nobody had higher scores. Well, you can't get higher scores than I got. So, you know, yeah, I got in because of my scores and because I push. But, um, just to get a PhD, you don't have to be, I mean, it helps if you're a smart person. It helps if you have ideas. Um, but what works the what what means the most is being able to work hard and um, talk to intelligent people. If you're not super intelligent yourself, you have to be able to communicate with the people who are. Thank you. To some extent, that's what I do. Look, I'm a very smart guy. I'm an extremely smart guy. But there are people who are way smarter than I am. And what I can do is I can sometimes talk to these people and they can eventually explain things to me. And once I understand it, then I'm able to explain it to everybody else. And I can write. So it turns out I can translate from these really smart people. Maybe something that's, that's interesting to you. I don't know. You probably, I don't know, what's, what do students do after they get through with this university, Liao? Do they usually go into industry? Oh, where do you want to go? I maybe further study. Um, yeah. She says for further study, for master or PhD degree. Um. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you anything. Um, you don't need to have a really specific thing that you know that you're going to do. You can be open to it. 
So I don't think that knowing the material is important. I think that you need to take the coursework. I mean, they, the programs like to see you take math. They like real analysis, okay? And in terms of exposure to economics, I had almost nothing when I started at Berkeley. I had had uh, two courses, uh, uh, master's courses in economics. That's all I ever had. I had no background at all. My background was mathematics, but my background was from 20 years before. Um, so you don't really need to have an economics background. What you need to have is the ability to get into these programs. And the ability to get into these programs is usually scores and letters and, and your grades to some extent too. You know, it's, it, the letters are a little bit more important than you might think. If you can get a letter from someone who's actually known to US universities, that will help you. Someone that has part of the network that I'm, these are things maybe they're not fair, but people do network and you tend to give more credibility to the people who you know who say something than what a stranger says. Maybe that's wrong, but it certainly is how people work. Um, so the more that you can connect into it, the better off, especially for the PhD program, because your letters are going to be important. I don't think coursework learning material is going to be so important. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can start doing research right away while you're in, in undergrad. I mean, maybe you can, in which case there's a lot you can do. But usually, isn't it the case there that undergraduate, you just stay in the courses, you don't, do people do experiments in, in undergraduate, Luya? Uh, yes, we, we have mm -hmm. like the behavior experiment class, and we are building a virtual experimental lab and a physical lab. And the students also have signature work. So in class here, we have a lot of uh, collaborative learning activities. Oh, rather, so so yeah. research projects, even as yeah, a freshman? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Well, in that case, what I tell you to do is go with what interests you. Go with your heart or your mind, but really more your heart. Go with your heart. Um, a criticism that I get, that I give or get or hear about um, the very, very bright Chinese students who come to the U.S. is that because of the system, you tend to look straight ahead always, and you may not be looking at things that you just in, are interested in and enjoy for their own sake. You tend to look at what's been put in front of you. I'm not trying to criticize. I tend to look all over the place. So if if doing research can tend to open things up for you, then I think what you should do is look at something that interests you, even if it seems kind of crazy. Does it have to be economic theory? No. Look at that exercise experiment that I did. That wasn't really about economic theory. Now you can change economic theory, but it's something interesting. So I, I would tell you, if you're going to do one of these projects, it depends. If you're trying to be strategic and get a grade, then I don't know what to tell you. But if, you're, if these are projects for you to develop your interests or gain intuition about people, then I say do something behavioral and see what people actually do. Because to me, that's where the action is. It's not like, you know, you can study physics, and then if you get a tiny deviation in the sixth decimal place, it's upsetting. But with people, oh, it's a lot of deviations. The trick is to find the regularities. Um, and you'll see that when I, when I go with the size. And really what I'm looking at is how will people behave? And to a certain, a certain extent, how do people think that other people are going to behave? Because I think at the bottom of all of this behavior, of all of this behavioral thing is beliefs. I think beliefs underlie everything. And we don't really know enough about how people form beliefs and how people are willing to change their beliefs. Um, I find that a very interesting question. I don't know that I have all the answers. I wonder how people engage in self-deception. I wonder how that works. I wonder how I can know that I deceive myself and still do it effectively. 
I, I don't understand that. It's interesting to me. Do I have the answers? No. I just have, sometimes I have questions, but you know, this, a lot of my questions come from life experience. So the thing about my son that led to the exercise paper, I had something else about responsibility from playing in two different uh, sports teams with different rules. And I had an insight about if you have responsibility for an outcome, you may take more, uh, you may be more honest or pro-social. That was part of my dissertation. I often just look at what I see around me. And if you look around, you, you will probably get ideas. So what I would encourage you to do, see, but I say this with a caveat because <laughs> Sorry. The school, then what you need to do is to get good grades. If your goal is to develop really your interests along the way as well, which I recommend because I find it easier to work hard if you can work on things that interest you, then I would encourage you to work on your interests. What do you think about that, Liu Yao? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I always work on my interest. Yeah, I, I think that's where you'll be happiest. Otherwise, it's painful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you need to do things that aren't your first most favorite things. But in general, you know, while you have the freedom to do so, work on, investigate the things that it investigate questions that you find interesting. That's what I recommend. That, that really, that, and that's good advice. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know if it's good advice. I think it's good advice. Whether it's good advice or not, I don't know. But I'm happy with that advice. But the best advice I can give you is if you want something on this world, ask for it. That's the very best advice. That's a very great advice because we would think if we want something uh first we need to understand if we are good for it and then we work very hard for it and we never asked for it <laughs> it's nice if you deserve it too i mean it's very nice to deserve it and earn it but you know if you think you've earned it if you don't think you've earned it then maybe you shouldn't ask for it okay but if you think you've earned it Why not? I, it's not hard. It's not hard. It's really easy. If you're, so here, what would you do in this situation? You get to the airport. You're running late. The line is unexpectedly long. It's longer than you expected. You've got a problem. If you wait through the line, you're probably not going to get to the gate in time to board the plane. So do you ask people to let you get ahead or do you miss your flight? What would you guys do? What would Raise you do? Your hand. How many people would miss their flight? Oh, uh, and how many people would ask to get forward in the line? One person. So one to zero. Two. I forgot to raise my hand too. Yeah, you should ask. You should ask, you know, you should ask. So um, I even have a story. I have a story about that. I have stories about all these things. I forget my stories. This is a story from Sweden and Denmark. I went to a conference in Sweden and I was taking a train in Sweden to go to the airport in Copenhagen to catch my flight back to California. So Okay, everything's fine. I have plenty of time. But suddenly the train stops out in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because somebody committed suicide by letting the train run into him. So we sit there for an investigation. It takes forever. And finally we're going and we've lost all the time. And there's just almost, this seems like it's impossible. But the woman sitting across from me 
worked for SAS, the Scandinavian airline. And she said, come with me to the airport and we'll see what we can do. So we got off the train and she, I rushed with her to the, to the, the counter. 15 minutes before the flight, 15 minutes from the counter to all the way at the gate, 15 minutes is all I had. And she got me to the Sooners big supervisor and uh, they got me a boarding pass and they said, you better run. <laughs> so I ran in my Birkenstocks, I ran. And I got to the long line at security and I just went up to the front. I didn't ask any people. I went up to the front and I said, I was on the train that had the suicide. And they said, oh, and they put me right in the front of the line and I ran to the gate and I got on the flight. It was unbelievable. It looked impossible, completely impossible. You don't know Copenhagen airport. You don't, I mean, it looked completely impossible, but if I didn't get on that flight, I wait a whole extra day. So I, you know, that's my story. Sometimes you can, you can, you can do more than you think you can do. Jewel, you consider math major and undergraduate study is more helpful for your grad study than major in English and undergraduate study. Yeah, you know, people will respect a math degree more than an econ degree, to be honest with you. Um, they like econ degrees, but if you say you have a e uh, math degree and you're interested in economics, they say great. So if you had to pick just one, again, you know, go with your heart. For me, it was much easier being in math because I didn't really have to work very hard. It was intuition for me. Um, but math is, is still more respected. The technical stuff is more respected. So especially coming from China, uh, maybe math is your best, might be best. So um, my honors math program at Michigan, the University of Michigan, was kind of a program geared to, to produce math professors. And that's what I was supposed to do. Um, but then I rebelled because of Vietnam and then I went out and moved to California and became a hippie forever and, you know, took a long time to come back. Um, but um, we had a lot of people from those programs that became economics professors and math professors. So it's quite common to have um, a math PhD, a math undergraduate degree and get an econ PhD. It's, it's quite common. So if you can handle the math, if you like the math, I would say do the math. And if you're interested in behavioral stuff, maybe you can take behavioral courses. But I don't know that you need the econ theory so much. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you take what you like. For example, somebody asked you something about macroeconomics for next year, but I don't know anything about macroeconomics. So what I learned about macroeconomics was to stop taking macroeconomics courses. I learned that in graduate school. So I stopped. Um, I, don't, I don't know macro. I know, I know what in certain areas I know a lot, but in other areas I know nothing at all. And that's, that's kind of how things have gone. It's a lot of specialization now, but this is at, at the high research levels. I mean, I can teach most economics, but I wouldn't be very good at macro. Um, for getting into graduate schools, you probably need special court. You probably have to satisfy a rigorous program to qualify for graduate schools in China, I would expect. Um, for the US, it's probably less rigorous around the coursework, I would guess. So Liao, you applied for PhD and you came out of Chinese school. Did, did you, was it important your coursework or, or, or not? Uh, I had another degree in mathematics. Well, so that helped you? I think so. Yeah, yeah I, I, I applied for a PhD directly uh, after my undergrad. So you got a degree in, in mathematics, yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's a good way to go. It's just, here's how I feel about math. 
I feel that math, you stay with math until it finally becomes too difficult for you. So you kind of <laughs> fall off along the way. And some people fall off earlier and some people never fall off and they become the mathematicians. But they are the craziest of all the mathematicians. They really are the craziest of all. What are you drinking? It looks I am drink, drinking cranberry juice with sparkling water. Oh, that's cool. There's words for this in German. Uh, what's the word? Uh, anyway, they, they do this kind of thing in Germany where they have fruit juices mixed with sparkling water. And so that's what I'm drinking. That's my favorite drink. Isn't that terrible? I don't drink alcohol. I drink cranberry juice. It's supposed to be good for you. Oh. All right, shall I go into slides? I think I'll go into slides. Uh, sure, you can share the screen. You are the co-host. Yeah, Here it says share screen, share, share screen. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to share from the bottom. Share where is my uh, PowerPoint? Must be this one. Mm -hmm. Have to do allow sharing. Oh, um, that's okay. Okay, have I shared my screen yet? No, so is this going to be difficult? Uh, here it is. Good, okay, good. Uh, is that working? Yes. We, we see the screen, social preference. So there's two parts to this uh, slides. One is called social preferences and the other is called communication. I don't have as many slides for social preferences, but I can talk for a, a long while. Now, really, realistically, what time is this supposed to end? I mean, 5.30 to 8, I don't know of anything that goes on that long, but you know, I can, I can talk pretty well. When do you really expect this to end? As long it. as you want. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. I mean, I'll, we'll do the slides. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. It'll start getting dark here. I may have to change, but you if can too see. late, you will see all of us eating lunch in the right. <laughs> As time. Well, and also my dinner too. So, so I'll talk about social preferences. I've talked a little bit about social preferences. I gave you that example about uh, the the lady paying my dollar toll because I let her in line. You know, that's a small example. Um, you know, there's issues like what would you do? Um, do you, what do you prefer? So here's, there's a study, I have a slide on this and, and we'll get to the slide, but social preferences have to do with um, what would people do to sacrifice their own money to either help or hurt another person who may have done something good or may have done something bad or may not have done anything at all. So what, what would you sacrifice for doing that? Or even if there's no sacrifice at all, but you get paid the same thing for different choices, what, what's your preference for someone else to have? And so these are questions that has to do with different areas in the world. It has to do with labor economics. It has to do with charities and, and philanthropic activities. Um, it has to do with real life. And so you get theorists who talk about how money is everything, but in their own life, they don't care at all about money. It's a real disconnect. Um, so social preferences, I think, are important. Social preferences it's hard to distinguish social preferences from social norms. And there are arguments about which came first, norms or preferences. Um, I don't know. To a certain extent, I think that norms are a bit deeper than social, than preferences. But I'm not sure of that because I think that even a loner who's not in society has some kind of social preference. So they're slightly separate, but it's related to norms and social norms and what's the right thing to do. And this comes up in some of the studies. Okay. Oh, so what do I have to do here? Huh, how do I advance to the next slide? 
Oh, there it is. Okay, good. That's working. Okay, so, um, you know, I invite, I don't know how this is going to work with chat. Somebody, Luya, if somebody has a question, you'll have to help me. Yeah, sure. But I like to have engagement, but, you know, I, I can also just talk. So the standard theory, people only care about their own money. And there's millions of lab experiments that say otherwise. The classic experiment, the oldest one, almost the oldest one, is something called the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you have a pair of people, and one of them chosen at random, let's say, has the right to choose to split that 10 units of money, let's call it $10. I don't know what the equivalent would be there, but you know, $10 um, between themselves and the other person, okay? Um, but there's a twist to it. So you can choose whatever you like. You can keep all 10, you can do 9.99 and a penny, you can do $5 and $5. Um, the other person is going to be given the allocation and asked to choose whether they want to accept it or reject it. So what standard economic theory says is that the proposer should say, I'll get $9.99 and you can have a penny. And people should say, great, I'll take the penny. But guess what? Would you take the one cent? I bet you wouldn't. I bet you'd say, this other person is being greedy and is taking too much for himself or herself to take 999 times as much as I'm getting. This isn't right. Or whatever you'd say to yourself somehow. You'd say no. So it's a failure. So economic theory doesn't explain everything. And that's sort of obvious, but you can find experiments that make this really clear, okay? But that's the essential content of social preferences. You you sacrifice money to help or hurt, or even to keep your own promises and, and avoid guilt by making a promise. This is a little bit in some of the work I have in communication. By making a promise, you might have someone rely on your promise. And if you have people rely on your promise, and then you cheat them, many people would feel guilty. So that's another kind of social preference. So why would you do any sacrifice? So one simple way or one real, I'm not gonna give you much technical detail. I'll show you a couple models, but one of the ways you do this is to formalize things and you can put weight on somebody else's payoff. You can put positive weight on their payoff. You can put negative weight on their payoff. Um, and why you do so may be your own individual characteristics. It could be that there's some history. It could be the situation involving the payoffs. But um, here's, a, here's the next slide. So really the first social preference model was something by Gary Bolton in 1991. And this came, was based on a paper by Oakes and Roth in 1989. So what they did in their paper, Oakes and Roth, they took the ultimatum game, except that they added a second stage to it. So now the first person makes an offer, the second person can say yes or no. If the person says yes, it's over. If the person says no, says no, it's not over. Now the second person gets to make a proposal to the guy who had made the proposal in the first round, but there's a discount factor so that the money in the second round is worth, I don't remember as much, it might've been half as much as in the first round. I think it might've been half as much. It's the natural thing to do half as much. I would have done it. And what did they find? They found an interesting phenomenon, something called, they call disadvantageous counteroffers. And what this means is that people would reject an offer that would have given them more money in real terms than they got by making their offer, their discounted offer. So they're actually taking less money, but now they're coming out ahead instead of coming out behind. 
So people cared about their position relative to the other person and the power or who has more, whatever. Um, and a lot of, there are a lot of disadvantageous counteroffers. So Bolton had the first model, nice model, published in the AER back when they liked experiments. And it said that you like money, but you don't like coming out behind. Fine. You don't have to come out ahead, but you don't want to come out behind. Maybe you're indifferent to how much ahead you are, but you don't like coming out behind. It's a very reasonable model. Um, Raven 93 was a big paper. Uh, it brought in psychological issues, psychological game theory into the mainstream of economics. This is quite a feat. Um, psychological game theory enriches the utility functions with psychological considerations. Um, in this particular paper, it was about something called fairness. And fairness in this paper was really based on, it was kindness-based reciprocity. Kindness was based on an interval or range between using Pareto efficient points, the maximum payoff uh, that you could give that the other person could give you versus the minimum payoff they could give you in the range and your kindness was an indi was based on that measurement and you would sacrifice money to help somebody uh, you believe is being kind or, or hurt someone who believe is being unkind. Um, and Doofenberg and Kersteiger extended this. Their paper was really a 1998 paper. It took them six years to get it published. Um, my dissertation paper took me eight years to get published, my, one of them. Anyway, they extended to ex, uh, sequential games, which is really more useful. Um, there's some other combination models. There's, there's, the, there's some of these. And then there's uh, Charnas and Rabin, which is probably on the next slide. If I can get there, here it is. Well, so the Charnas and Rabin looks horrible. I'm gonna break it down though. So Ferenc Schmidt is sort of a, the main best known social preference model outside of economics, certainly. It's very easy. It's very easy. Um, what do you have? You have your utility, your person I, and the other person's person J. Your utility is of X. X is a monetary payoff or some vector, a vector of monetary payoffs, I guess is equal to your monetary payoff minus a factor alpha sub i times the, the maximum of how much the other guy has minus what you have or zero. So if you have more than the other guy, that factor washes out, right? If because if, if x sub j is big if x sub i is bigger than x sub j, then that's a negative number and then the maximum is going to be zero. So that term is going to drop out. So that's the term that, that matters when you have uh, less than the other person. And then there's a beta sub i where you lose utility with it reversed. And now it's the maximum of x sub i minus x sub j or zero. So now that one only matters if you have more than the other person. So x sub i minus x sub j is a positive number. So it becomes the maximum. So if, and if, if they're equal to each other, then both terms drop out. So what this says is that they go on to try and explain behavior in a lot of experimental games, although they miss a ton of games, they explain a number. Uh, and they argue that alpha is a bigger number than beta, alpha sub i has to be greater than or equal to beta sub i, and beta sub i has to be at least zero. And if you draw the, the graph, it's gonna have a kink in it at zero because they have different slopes. You alpha, alpha and beta may not have the same value until so they're gonna have a kink. Anyway, that's an interesting model. Um, it's very easy to test and to make predictions with. It's very, very easy. The, 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 it's arithmetic, it's just arithmetic. Um, Charnas and Rabin is a pine, kind of a messy model, but I'm going to simplify it for you. So you look at this hideous mess, which I copied from the paper. Um, you care about 
your own payoff. So that's the pi sub i in the first term. I guess this will work, right? I can just so you you can see me moving this, right? Yes. No. Yes. I think you. Yes. Good. So this is this is the weight you have on your own payoff, and this is the weight you put on a social payoff. Okay. So the brackets go from here all the way to the end. Okay. This is a social payoff. So you've got a, a delta term and you've got a weighted average here of, of this is basically the sum of all the payoffs. You could ignore this. This has to do with demerits. This is about negative reciprocity. With there's no negative reciprocity, then you have a weight that you're putting on the minimum payoff of everybody in the reference group. And you also have a weight that you're putting on the 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 minimum. Now this is this is uh, this is the minimum and this is the maximum. So you're putting some weight on the maximum, putting some weight on the minimum. Um, and if there's no negative reciprocity, which is this funny k term and this b term and this thing, it's it's a reasonable model in which you care about both the total payoff and the distribution of the payoff as well as your own money. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples of this in a, in a table more than you're going to want. But that's the idea. And what this also says, if someone has misbehaved, then you may add something to their minimum payoff. So you're going to care less about them having the minimum payoff and maybe not even at all care about it. And here, if a person's misbehaved a lot, so the demerit coefficient is high, this could be zero. And you may not care at all about their total payoff either. And this is an extra term that we needed for even the ultimatum game. This is where you're so pissed off that you'll sacrifice your own payoff to hurt the other person. Okay, so that's complicated and you don't really need to know that, but that's the idea in the model. And the models really explains a lot. Oh, here's a fun little chart. So this is a difference between the models predictions. So the models, if you don't have reciprocity conditions, Here's an ISO utility line. So along this line, you're getting the same utility, let's say. And your utility is increasing as you move to the Northeast. Here's Fair Schmidt. Here's your, so this says, Charnas and Rabin says, you have a positive coefficient here. So the more that the other person gets, holding your own payoff constant. So as you hold X constant, you're happier and happier as the other guy gets more money. <clears throat> you put positive weight on it. Here, you're getting X. And if it's anywhere off of X for somebody else, <clears throat> you'd like it to become X. So your bliss point is right here at X and X. That's your preference. Here, Bolton and Occam tells us is a similar model, but they aggregate differently. So now you're trying to match the ratio. It's not pairwise comparisons like you could in a multiply person game. Now you're matching the ratio. So if you're off the ratio, you push towards the same ratio. And this is something else called competitive preferences, which is sort of the opposite of, of this. And it's like you like the other person to get less than you do. And I'll give you a nice example of that in a moment. Okay, so this is small. I don't know if you can see this at all. Can I make this bigger? Maybe. Can I make this bigger? Uh, I think you. it's at, at I the might bottom. Be able to make it bigger. Yeah. Look, I got it bigger. So I'll do that a couple of times. So what was that? All right. So zoom in. Is that big enough? I'll do one more time. kind of cool you can do this all right so we had to start with so what did I do I had simply simple games I played them both in Barcelona which is where I got my first starting job in Spain in 1997 I didn't get a job the whole year and then I fell into this job well I basically asked for it but it was a coincidence I went you know it's a long these are stories but I will say that 
because I was still interested. I went to a conference, even though I was done with, I had my PhD and I was out of academics. I went to an experimental conference. I presented one of my papers, my biggest paper from my dissertation. And it happened that the guy at the conference, at my session had been the chair of a department in Spain that I had applied to. And they had been a little interested in me, but nothing ever happened on it. And I met him in the lobby and I talked to him and he said that they were actually interested in me. And I said, well, it's flattering, blah, blah, blah. And then I found out they were hiring again. And so I wrote him and I said, hey, it's me. Is there some chance? He said, well, let me check. He said, yeah, visiting position. So I, I applied and I got a visiting position. And that was my first start. So I ran it in Barcelona. And uh, also I was on leave and I, oh, I was, I was home some of the time too. Uh, so I ran in Berkeley too, in both places. So I picked simple games and sometimes they just played one. Sometimes they played two. Sometimes they played both roles in Berkeley. I think they played up to eight games. I mean, I varied a lot. Raven said, just gather data. Don't worry. So I really went crazy with it. Here's a simple game. So you're B and your payoff is the second number. You're going to get 400. Would you rather that the other person gets 750 or would you rather that the other person gets 400? We got 69% choosing 750 for the other person when it didn't cost them any money at all. We got 69%. That's not what Farron Schmidt says. It should be equal. Here's one where it costs you a little bit of money. So now, if you don't like 400, 400, if you like this better, because maybe the total payoff is bigger, you'd sacrifice 25 units to give the other person 350. Would you do this? To me, this is like an elevator door story. Um, you're in an elevator and it's a dark hallway but you can see that someone's trying to run to catch the elevator and the door is starting to close. Do you hold the door? It costs you a little bit, but it's worth a lot to the other person. So that's what I think of this as. And you get about half and half. I would like to see more, but at least you get half and half. So people will sacrifice a little money to help somebody else. And this is what I did. So that was in Barcelona. This was in Berkeley, very similar, 50-50. Here's one. So you're B. So this is the ultimatum game, right? Except it's a little bit not fair because we don't get much rejection anyway in the game. But here's the basic game. So you're asked, do you prefer that? Now you're the only one making a decision. There's another person, but the other person's done nothing. Would you prefer that you get 200 and the other person gets 800 or you both get nothing? And you don't know who the other person is. And you're never going to know. Guess what? This is one of those rare 100% results. Everybody chose that they would take the smaller amount of money. But if you do an ultimatum game and you say, I propose that I get 80%, you get 20%, lot, you get a lot of rejections. So that goes to intention being important, which is... I think a very important issue that goes to negative reciprocity. You will actually sacrifice money here. Many people will. I mean, what did we get? Well, this, that wasn't sacrificing money. Nobody will sacrifice money if the other person hasn't done anything to them. Now, here's a funny one. These two are funny ones together. Uh, these two are funny ones. So here's a game where you and you can you can choose to get 600 and the other person gets 300 and you're ahead or you can sacrifice 100 so that they get 400 more and they're now ahead of you so how many people do that 33% will make that sacrifice to increase the other person's payoff by 400 by giving up 100 but here's the same ratio here and now the difference is that you can either keep 700 and the other person gets 200 and you're way ahead, or you sacrifice 100 and now you're equal. This is much more attractive. It's still 400 to 100. It's much more attractive. And now instead of 33%, you get 73%.
which is startling. I mean, it's clearly that's important to people. Clearly that matters. These are very, very, very simple games. For someone to claim to you that the students, the subjects didn't know what they were doing is ridiculous. So it's really simple. These are super simple games. It was a paradigm that we basically kind of introduced. Well, it existed before, but we made extensive use of it. And here's one. So how many people, this is interesting, I guess. How many people would sacrifice, would, how many people would take 400, 400? How many people would take 800? Or how many would split it? And people claim People say that, so people say only 22% would split it and 78% would take all of it, which is probably true. It's probably accurate. Okay, so that's an interesting result. Now I wanted to look at, at, at response games where um, B payoffs, well, no, I'll, I'll do the official thing I started with. So what I started with was, first of all, uh, I started with, this one. No, I started with what was my baseline? Actually, I think it's what I started with. Bark three. Where's bark one? Here. This is what I started with. Okay. This is the first game. How can I tell? Because it has the number one. Very nice. Um, so you can choose, and this will go a little bit towards methodology. So um, how did I pay people and how did I incentivize all of their choices? So the, there was a person who asked about methodology and this is a case where I went crazy with something called the strategy method. I actually have a couple of papers on the strategy method, survey papers supporting the use of it, although I'm still cautious about it. But with the strategy method, what you do is you say you're going to be making X number of choices. And at the end of the experiment, we're going to draw one or two or some number of the choices that you've made for actual payoff. And this allows you to um, actually in increase what looks like the payoff. The, the size of the payoffs looks bigger, but it has a smaller chance of being happening. So it seems to be effective. So I did a lot of these games. Okay. What the strategy method gives you, I'll show you here right now, the big advantage of the strategy method. So you can choose your A for, this was, this was a, well, 550 a piece, whatever that means to you. Or you can let B choose between 400 each, or maybe B will let you have 750 and only take 375. So if you're A, you want to think about what B is thinking about. And so B is looking at that and saying, hey, a could have given me 550, but now A is sticking me with either 400 or 375. Do I feel like sacrificing 25 to help this guy out? No, I don't. So you don't get much choice of people going to the right. You get very little choice of people going to the right. Almost nobody tries it, right? It's very rare. It happens. It happens maybe 5% of the time, 6% of the time. But when you play with the strategy method, what you do is you stand up there at the board and you say, okay, so A's out there, here's your decision. And, and if you don't, if you choose in, then B is going to be making this choice. So B, notice that your choice only matters if A has chosen in. So what I want you to do is to imagine that A has chosen in and what would you do if A has chosen in? If A actually chooses in, then your choice actually will matter. So I convey that. and Everybody understands it. There's no comprehension problem at all. Um, so that's how I do the experiment. And actually what you see is that very few Bs will, will sacrifice money in that situation. All right? And you see, you see that. And then I wanted to look at, okay, this is negative reciprocity. So I wanted now to look at positive reciprocity. So then I went to Bark 2, I think. Oh, Bark 2 is a different game. It was a dictator version. I did the dictator version. And I said, oh, well, okay, it's up to 50-50. It was down way below. Now it was 10% or whatever below there. Now it's 50-50. Now maybe I can get positive reciprocity or so I thought. So I went with this one. 
And this is A is, can you to choose to take 725 and give you zero, or he can let you choose between 400, 400, or 750, 375. Well, if I'm B, I think A is a hell of a guy. He could have given me zero. He's taking a chance on me. I would choose 753, 75 in a heartbeat. And I thought that's what people would choose. Is that what they chose? No, it's not what they chose. And I tried it with 800 in case there's some ambiguity here. I tried it with 750 just to keep it the same. And I never got anywhere. I got 38%, 39%. Where's the positive reciprocity? Uh, compared to the this game, where is the positive reciprocity? It's not there. What's the story here? I don't really have a good story. I can only say that there's a rationalization that there's a couple of rationalizations. One is that, okay, A didn't choose the big payoff, so A must really want to have even payoffs. So I'm just doing what A wants when I choose 400, 400. Well, that's kind of crazy, I think. And the other is, well, that, that is one of them. And the other is sort of the same thing, but a little different. A had a chance of getting a good payoff. A had a chance. A didn't take the chance. I have no responsibility for A's payoff. A, if he wanted a good payoff, should have chosen out. And that's what people do. So you don't see positive reciprocity at all. It's very rare. You see negative reciprocity. You see a bunch of other things in these games. I don't know if there's anything totally interesting in these games that you need to see. Um, oh, there's some funny, here, there's some three-person games. I invented this myself. because This is also methodology. So I had three-person games, and person C is choosing between two sets of payoffs, 400-400-X or 750-375-X. What is X? X is a number. So I stand in front of the I did this in Barcelona. I think these were all in Barcelona. No, one was later in Berkeley. Okay. I stood in front of the group and I said, here's a piece of paper. I've written a number on, on, on the back of this paper. I'm putting the paper on the desk right here. I put it right there on the desk. And I said, I'm leaving the paper here. This is what X is. X was actually 500. But I didn't want them comparing what they had with the other payoffs. I wanted them to be neutral about it and make pay up, make payoff decisions. And so I actually thought it was a clever device. And that's what we did. So now you're C. So do you want to give each person 400? Or do you want to give one person 750 or 375? It's still pretty close to 50 50, although now it's 54% more towards efficiency. There is a dislike of small minimum payoffs, right? And you see it even more here. This is a game where this is 800 in utility, and this is 11 and a quarter. And this is even bigger. This is 1,200, and this is 800. So if you like efficiency, you should even more choose this, but that's not what you get. People don't like this zero. They just don't like it. Only 18% go for that. And here's a game where you can choose even payoffs for everybody and sacrifice 25 from the average or two guys, but it's efficient. And it's also about 50, 50, but in, in this direction. So that's what I'll show you about those games. Oh, now I'll show you some interesting things. So let's see. So in terms of unstable in the connection, move to this direction. So here's a... Um, if you, what is this decision to, uh, I don't know, but here's, here's decisions that you can take. So would you like to do 600, six and a quarter a piece or 1200 for the A and 600 for you sacrificing 25? Or here, do you like taking money away? Are you so unhappy that the guy is 1200 that you'll take 25 away from yourself and take 600 away from the other guy? But this is the one I like the best of all. And we gave Bolton and Ockenfels the best chance of anything. So this, you're B, and you're, you're getting 600 no matter what. 
We even give a separate fork for B1, which is 600 C, 600. You don't really need it because just B2 alone is you choose X and X is somewhere between 300 and 1200. And so we give people the best chance to choose 600. And what do we get? What we get is written down below and there's a distribution, but I'll, well, you can read it. Uh, maybe I have to move it a little bit. No, you can still see it, okay. Um, so here's the distribution. Uh, basically, there were this, there were 11 choices out of 108. There are 10% of the choices for 600. People were not all that keen about choosing 600. What do you really get? You get 1,200. You get 74% of the time they're choosing 1,200. They'd rather the other person gets the most possible. Now, some people chose lower, but this is my very favorite choice of all, 599. So why did the person choose 599? Because they got 600 and the other person got 599. They got more than the other person. It was really funny, really funny. So the guy did that and then we were paying the guy who got the 599 in pesetas and we paid him 600 pesetas and, and he's, you know it was 599 he looked at that and he laughed and um, he insisted on giving us back one peseta to make it exactly right it was really really funny because everybody knew why the guy had chosen 599 so the guy wanted to be ahead but he didn't want to hurt the other person it's very cute so people have a lot of preferences, and this, this was an interesting study too. Uh, that, that's one of my favorite little choices. All right, now there's this big issue about social preferences in the field. Many of you may have heard of this guy named John List. John List is a friend of mine, but John List is a very strategic guy. So along the way, John List decided he wanted to win a Nobel Prize. Well, the reality is that John List is well on his way to winning a Nobel Prize, but he decided that the way to, for him to win a Nobel Prize was to make field experiments a big deal and downplay lab experiments, because that's what his specialty is, is field experiments. So he has these papers with by himself and Levitt and List, social preferences aren't found in the field, they're, they're evanescent, they're fleeting, there's some papers that they, the experiments, Hulk and, Feckman, Hulk and Heckman have a paper in science that goes the opposite way. Other people disagree. Big controversy. Kammerer hates it. Kammerer hates this stuff. He says he looks at, he says you can generalize. He looks at this thing again, doesn't support the claims made. He, he talks about, you know, this is a, an issue. So people say it does. There is evidence to say. So here's a paper that they looked at the parameter for pure effects using data from both the field and from lab experiments. They happen to get the same estimates. They get the same treatment. I mean, it's very interesting. So it's not clear, but uh, the argument in um, Falk and Heckman is that theory is supposed to be theory in every environment. Theory doesn't come with, well, it depends if it's with this subject pool, then it's this, or if it's regular people, it's this. Theory is supposed to be theory and uh, you can test it. And they say the lab is a very good source for how to, how to test theory. And it is, it's the best control that you're gonna get. It's completely the best control. And the way I look at this is that, you can look at it this way. There are many ladders to the same roof. There's something valuable up on the roof. You wanna get there. There are many ladders, there are many different ways that you can get up on the roof, but they're all valid. You can, you can do it with experiments, you can do it with theory. You want to get to the truth and maybe you can stack the ladders and go even higher. But there are many ways to get there and you want to use the tool. I have a paper and it has this great, it's a two page paper. It has this great opening line I was inspired. Um, and this is when they're talking about, oh, the lab is terrible and the field is great. And the name of the paper, it's a little chapter in a book. It's called The Hammer and the Screwdriver. And I say, sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need a screwdriver. They're both useful tools. It's best to use the tool that sits, that's, that's best for the purpose. And that seemed obvious to me. Um, 
And so that's what I have to say about it. You know, I think it's useful. Does it generalize the field? I think it does. Some people may not think so, but I think it does. And that's, I did a lot, I did a lot of that. And uh, I'm not as interested in that anymore, I have to say, but I, you know, I still like it. Why does this work? I don't know. I'm having trouble with this. Are people still so I, I actually have a question about this positive okay, reciprocity. So yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking like if, uh, because this is just uh, one shot, but how about if I see the other person did not do positive reciprocity, and next time I do not want to do good to him anymore. That's right. So in reality, um, in reality, you are playing in the real world and there's often repeat game consequences. And repeat game consequences change everything because now you don't know why somebody's doing something nice or they did something that looks like it was mean, but actually they didn't think about it and it's just, they were incompetent. They did something and you were hurt but they didn't mean to hurt you. And many times it's impossible to tell. So what happens in real life? You partially, you know, when someone does something nice to you and you think that they're doing something nice to you because they're expecting you to do something back in return, maybe they are, but maybe they're just being nice. You usually can't tell. The case of going to the hospital to pay our respects, that was clearly just being nice though. But usually you can't tell. If a pretty girl in academics is smiling at me, does that mean that, that she wants me to smile? I mean, what does that mean? Does she want me to co-author a paper with her? I mean, whatever, people get suspicious and you can't really disentangle it very well. So in a repeat game environment, you don't wanna be nasty to somebody because you know, I would expect if someone's nasty to me, I'm going to be nasty to them. It's a bad equilibrium. It's a very bad equilibrium. So, I mean, I think societies do better. Well, so there's the question. Do you need to have negative reciprocity in the society to keep people from being too selfish and from acting in, in ways that are too antisocial? That's, that's an arguable theory. That's an evolutionary theory for why it's present. You need it. You need someone to be doing it. And there, everybody free rides off the people who are enforcing it. Not everybody gets mad. Not everybody stands up for the rules, right? Or the, the right way. Some people do and the rest of the people are free riders on it. I'm one of the people who always ends up acting and people free ride, but I can't help it. I, I can't help it. I always have to act. It's a weakness. But, uh, Anyway, I'm having trouble getting to my next page, which is interesting. How about maybe if I, what happened here? How do I get to the next page? Oh, there's the next page, very good. All right, we've arrived at the second part of my talk, or the third if you count. Oh, and look, we went back to yesterday. It's still the 16th here. So today is yesterday now for you. So how come that's not quite, up where I want it to be. I don't know. Let me just, oh, good. Cheap talk. So there's all kinds of communication. You have communication where it's binding. So if you say something, you're held by contract to doing something, or it could go to a courtroom. Um, you can have communication that is costly, so you have to spend money to communicate. Or you can have what they call cheap talk, which is really free talk. Um, it's a misnomer, it should be free talk, where it costs you nothing to send a message, you can communicate, um, and in, in the field, it's very common. There's lots of communication, you usually communicate. So for example, people talk about contracting with, uh, with other people. How can you possibly contract when you don't have communication? And yet contract theory is mostly ignored it completely which is fascinating to me. How can you, it's like ignoring how people really are. And I, they're missing something. So as is frequently the case, not every agreement is binding and there are things that aren't covered. And what do you do in those situations? So in many of those cases, there's cheap talk and it makes a difference often. I don't know what there is going on with this laptop. Why can't I get to the next page? I don't know. 
That's a real mystery, so. Maybe I have to uh, get it out of. There I am, that's much better. Okay, I'm out of there, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so my claim is that communication can make a big difference. Cheap talk, even in one shot cheap talk, there's no reputation. There may be a reputation to yourself. So that's another issue. I consider issues like that. So I consider that one has a reputation. You have a, you have a social image, but you also have a self image. And my self image is important because I take myself with wherever I go. Um, I don't steal candy from babies, or well, maybe I don't want to, but even if I did, I don't do it because I would know that I had stolen a candy from a baby, and I'd always carry that around with me, and I don't want that. So, um, you know, basically what I'm saying is that you have self-reputation, but you also have social reputation. But this even abstracts from social reputation, and it's, it could involve self-reputation, which brings in guilt. Guilt is about your own internal thing, and I have models on guilt, and maybe I'll talk about that in some of this. A little bit I'll talk about it. Okay. Not all forms of communication work in all environments. So this is my own little theory that's never really been modeled. I think, so it's true that in some cases, simple messages can easily affect outcomes and others, they don't do anything. And I think it matters a lot whether there are multiple equilibria from which to select or there is a single and unique equal, dash equilibrium, which makes it a lot harder. So um, there's non-face-to-face -face communication. I mean, face-to-face -face is a different element altogether um, it's hard to study that in the lab, so it's, it's really uncontrolled. Um, I've done a little of that, but it's hard. Um, but nowadays, there's a lot of non-face-to-face. -face. I mean, this is what we're doing now. This is not face-to-face. -face. This is by Zoom. This is, this is what everybody does now. So you're going to interact this way. So I'm going to show you some results, and then I'm going to talk about some things. So communication has been effective. Why, why not? And I say there's this difference that it works well when it's selecting one, but it, not, it doesn't work to move behavior away from a bad social equilibrium. And I don't know any theory about what makes a message credible. I have a paper that tries to get at this, but I wouldn't say it does a convincing job. There isn't much theory about it. Um, I say communication is very natural. It's everywhere. So I'm going to show you uh, one of my earliest papers. It's my fourth paper um, with communication in something called Almond's Conjecture, which is a stack on. But it doesn't work at all when I change the game very simply into a prisoner's dilemma. Um, there's another game, I won't show you that one, where they're talking about uh, manager-worker interactions in the minimum effort game. They find communication is more effective than monetary incentives, actually. And here's something that involves contracts, where there's, if you have better communication, you get to better contracts, better quality, better efficiency, everybody makes more money, everybody's happier. But without the free form communication, with restricted communication, it doesn't work at all. So there's some background. Um, here's an example that should be very obvious to everybody. Suppose that, uh, well, this shouldn't be a simultaneous game. So here's a, this is an interesting question for you. So think about it, this first of all is not a simultaneous game, but think about this as a game where there's a first mover and a second mover. So suppose that this person here, the row player moves first, and then this person's going to move second. Okay. It's not really the right form for the game. I understand that. So if you're choosing first, you're going to choose A because you get the most. And you know that the other person's going to be stuck with, well, do I want one or do I want zero? They're probably going to choose one. 
So what's going to happen if, in this case, is the first mover is going to get what they want in a sequential game? But here's an experiment that I try to do a little bit, but I don't think I did it right. But I haven't completely, I guess I have given up on it. But it's a, it's a cheap thought experiment. Uh, well, I try to do this with mental messages, which is much wilder. But suppose that you have a simultaneous game. You're going to make the same choice at the same time. But player, this guy can send a message to this guy. And the message says that I intend to play, and you circle A or you circle B. What do you think is going to happen? This guy is going to send a message that says, I'm going to play A, and this guy is going to believe it and play A as well. So even a message gets you to the same outcome, which is kind of interesting. But you can see that you could get this, and that a communication could be really easy. It could be really easy. Okay. Now here's another game. This is the one, the fourth one that I ever did. This was a, I had a lot of help in this experiment. It's a sole authored paper, but I had a lot of help. So this was an idea that Rabin gave me before I, when I was going to Spain. Um, Almond's conjecture. So here's Almond's conjecture. So this person can send it, the payoff. It's, it's uh, symmetric. But this person is the sender. This person can send a message to the other guy saying, I intend to play, and you circle A or you circle B. Okay? You have to send a message, A or B. And then this guy takes, gets the message, then they simultaneously play the game. And so Almond makes this observation, which is completely correct. He says, if you, if you intend to play, no matter what you intend to play, you always prefer that the other person plays, chooses B. Why? If you choose A, you get 8 instead of 7. If you choose B, you get 9 instead of 1. So it's always in your interest to try to influence the other person towards choosing B. What's the best signal you can send to influence them to choose B? Well, it's a signal that you intend to choose B. You're a rational person, right? So everybody should signal B, but nobody should believe it. So it, it carries no information. This was Almond's conjecture. It's impeccable logic. Farrell and Rabin 96 say great logic, but we don't think it's what would happen. Rabin says test it. So we change it. So what do we get? So first of all, if you play this with no signal, you get people choose B uh, about, uh, people choose A, we'll focus on A, uh, people choose B, we'll stay with B. People choose B about, this is that condition, 35% of the time. People choose B 35% of the time. But with a signal of B, the rate of choosing B, given a signal B, goes is 94%. And it's the same thing for the receiver and the sender. It's unbelievable. So even unconditional. So there's 95% uh, of the signals are B. But even unconditional, 85% of the outcomes are 9-9. Nine, nine. Um, just from having the signal, OK? Um, we, it was unbelievably strong. So I was a little bit concerned that I got this effect because people thought that their signal, their bond, what they wrote down, they were, they had to do it. So Drajan Prelek said, why don't you change the past to make their prisoner's dilemma? So I did that. And what I did was instead of eights here, I made these twelves which makes it into a prisoner's dilemma. You'll have to imagine that. I don't have a slide for it. It makes it into a prisoner's dilemma. And now what happens is that people are still signaling B, but the likelihood that somebody plays B, given that there was a B signal, is not 94%, it's 10%. So nobody believes it and nobody follows it. They're still sending it 80% of the time, but nobody's following it. And they understand it. So one type of signal works, the free, in this one, the free form, the simple signal works fine um, when there are two equilibria, but it doesn't work at all when the only equilibrium is a bad one. So I'm burning out. I'm going to give you more, though. Oh, here's, there's a second one, okay? How do you make sense of it? Is there any theory? No, there isn't any theory. 
So this is something principal agent environments, uh, hidden action, and uh, I'm going to talk about free form and restricted method messages. And I'm going to show you a game and I'm going to skip through this because I am burning out. So this isn't what they were shown. They were shown a table. And in the table it said, if A does this and B does that, then this is what happens. And there are like six rows and they could see each row and I would call on people on the instructions to say, what would happen if such and such and such? And I'd call somebody in the audience and that had the effect of making the person answer, but everybody else in the audience also was worried I might call on them, so they paid more attention. And uh, they had to answer the questions and then they understood the game, but this was what the game looks like drawn out this way. So A has a choice, A can choose out. If A chooses out, they both get $5. If A chooses in, then B has a choice. And B can choose to either roll a die or not roll a die. Rolling a die is considered effort. Not rolling a die is choosing no effort. It costs you $4 to roll the die, but you increase the other person's payoff. So if you don't roll the die after the guy chooses in, you would get 14, the other guy would get zero. However, if the guy rolls, you're gonna get 10 for sure, and an expectation the other guy is going to get 10 because you're going to roll a six-sided die. If it comes up two, three, four, five, or six, they get $12. If it comes up one, it's zero dollars. Okay. So this was the game, and this is the basic game. But what we also did, I don't know if it's the next slide or not. No, I'll leave it with this one. What we also did was we allowed B to send a message to A of any sort, three, four messages. And this turned out to have a big effect. We also did another calibration, which isn't so important, but the journal made us change these fives to sevens. Why? Because they didn't trust that we didn't happen to get lucky in picking a calibration. So we got stronger evidence with the sevens. How did we do this? We had people in a room, um, an average of about 30 people in a session, maybe 15 on this side and 15 on this side. Uh, I, read, I flipped a coin, so whichever side was A and the other side was B, I randomized. Um, A's made the decisions. I then collected the decisions from the A's. Then I told B's they could make their decisions. Often it was strategy method. In this experiment, I think, yeah, we did this one strategy method. And, um, <coughs> And so we collected all the data from the A's and then B's knew that they couldn't affect A's choices because I'd collected them already. And then B's make contingent choices. If A has chosen in, what would you do? Okay. Um, and the communication treatment, the B could see the message and a sheet of paper. How did I do that? So I had a pairing scheme. Everybody had an ID number. And the way I paired people was person number one, and the odds was paired with the highest even numbered person. No, that's not what I did. The lowest numbered person was paired to the highest numbered person. And so the sum was constant for everybody is what I did for each pair. And, um, and then I put the numbers on the corners and then I tore one corner off when I figured out what, who was going to what. And I brought it to the person where it was still on the corner. And they couldn't know where it came from if they even know the person's ID. So it's really anonymous. Um, so that's what I did there. Okay, so what did I get? Um, this is one of the treatments, I guess. Maybe I have both. No, this is just one of the treatments. But what I really got was an improvement. And um, I don't know if you can see the end of this. Yeah, you can. You don't have the same problem that I see. All right. So here's what happened. So it improved the rate of roll. It, it improved the in rate slightly. It wasn't really significant, but it improved it slightly from 55.56% to 73.8 something percent. It was borderline significance on a one tail test. This was much bigger. So from 44% to 67%, um, it increased it by half. Okay, and this actually is significant even with these small numbers. Um, 
The more interesting thing is over here, oops, not this one, this one. So this one, the actual in and roll combination, which is where you get social efficiency, happened 50% of the time with messages, but only happened 20% of the time without messages. So it was really significant. So communication really helped. The root on this was you were sending a message promising something. You say, I swear upon my mother's grave that I'm going to cooperate. And I'm going to choose to roll. And some of the messages are credible, and the ones that were more credible contained promises. That turned out to be the single biggest issue, was whether something contained a statement of intent. It made it credible. Um, we, oh, it affected beliefs. So we have a lot of statistics here. It affected the beliefs. That's the mechanism for what you're getting changes. Uh, you're getting guilt because your beliefs are changing. Promises and behavior. So when there were promises, when there was a promise, A shows in 92% of the time. When there wasn't a promise, it was only 50%. Here, it, didn't, it wasn't that significant. The 7-7 seven, seven treatment was much bigger. Um, but this combination was very big. So with in and roll, it was 67% of the time versus 27. Uh, there's a 7-7 seven, seven treatment as well. Communication leads to much, but you can see everything's going way up. Okay. And here's the numbers. Um, and they changed the beliefs again, although this cell didn't matter. But there's a pretty good correlation. So the foundation of guilt aversion, the theory says that the more that you expect the other person believes that you're going to do something favorable or the right thing, the more guilt you're going to feel if you don't do it. So if you're playing poker and you make a bet that's representing that you've got a really good hand and you don't have it, you don't feel any guilt at all because nobody expects it to be honest. But in normal society, it's kind of expected to be honest. So it has this effect. Um, big significance here. Really big significance. Promises drive the behavior. Um, it's very impressive. The Z statistics are off the wall. We did something called bear promises. Bear promises, we they could only send a message like in China's 2000 that it's either I promise to roll or I don't promise to, or I, I'm going to choose A or I don't choose, or I'm going to, I, I promise I, I'm going to choose, I intend to play A or B. And this was, they could either send a message saying they promised to, they promised to roll or they could send a blank message. So what happened? Everybody sent the promise to roll. <laughs> People lied and nobody believed it. <clears throat> And so this was the idea that it's just the promise per se. And we say, no, it's not the promise per se. So that was all we did. Um, what do we get? We get no real changes. No real changes here. So bare promises didn't matter. What's still open to interpretation, I don't know if you took the same messages from promises and partnership that were endogenously created and you gave them as options to people to choose from in a menu, I don't know if the message was, would be as effective as when they're endogenous. That's something for research, and there hasn't been much, if any. Uh, there wasn't anything really happening. And I am going to call it a day, I'm afraid. Discussion, no, I'm going to skip all this. Yeah, we and can see you in dark already. It's already dark. Well, and can we can hear the duck. Yeah. yeah. Is, is there duck there? Yeah, it's dark outside. It yeah, is dark cool. outside. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Oh, don't say, oh, stop screen sharing. Okay. Yeah. Thank oh, you, you guys. so much. Must be lunchtime, right? <laughs> it's dinner time for me. <laughs> I so, hope to see you in China someday. <laughs> yeah, so I hope that was interesting. I mean, I know I rushed a bit, and I know I slipped back into my own dialect. It's hard not to. It's really hard not to. But you see, I do interesting stuff. I think what I do is interesting. I don't know if what I do is really economics as much as it is 
human behavior. But it has a lot of impact on what people do in economic environments. I consider it interesting. I may be giving you bad advice when I tell you to look for your interests, look for what, what you think is an interesting question rather than just following the grind. But I'm not sure my advice is any good for you in China. Here is the advice that I give. But I don't know. And maybe someday in China, maybe someday in China, maybe someday they'll actually invent something where I could just teleport myself to China. Yeah, we, we think so. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody. Good night. <laughs> See you. Uh, I will send uh, the comments to you so the students see write okay, some comments. That is our remote student. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I like yeah, that. Yeah, so, some, some of the students was not able to come on campus because of corona. Like, you know, so. we're not allowed to go on campus. I haven't been on campus since uh, March. Uh, cool. Hope, oh, uh, hope that this situation will end that. soon. And Let's see you in the U.S. as well. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.